We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast. Hopefully your day is going well. It is Tuesday. Did a little live yesterday. I did it on YouTube. And that was much different than what I do on TikTok because it wasn't quite as so frenetic. There wasn't as many people coming through, which is fine. And we had a lot of questions and a lot of fun with it. I'm going to try to figure out how to uh, do YouTube lives with a guest so we can talk like we're going to do here today. I have with me today, Eric from Iowa. And uh, welcome, Eric. And I wanted to bring something up about Iowa and see if you think it makes a difference. But, well, uh, thanks for having me. And I'm inter- I, I've got a feeling I know what you're going to talk about. Well, let's see what it is. Well, I heard everybody talking about how, I think it was back in 2020, <laughs> Donald Trump won Iowa by 14 points or 16 points or something like that. Yeah, it was bad. And And then now... Kamala is only trailing Donald Trump by four points, at least a 10 point loss by Donald Trump. That's not a win, but it says some things. Well, it's even worse than that, actually, for Donald Trump. Back in June or July, the Des Moines Register did a poll before Joe Biden stepped out of the race. Right. Donald Trump was winning by 18 points. Oh, wow. So it's a 14-point swing in the favor of Kamala Harris. And that's just from the people who uh, answered the poll. Right. And I know Des Moines Register at one time, their polling method was they were only polling subscribers with landlines, which you get a lot of boomers doing that. Which yeah. That's even worse for Donald Trump if that's who they were talking to. Right, right, exactly. Well, and the, the thing about it is, is that uh, um, – it seems somehow that Republicans find Kamala more palatable than Joe Biden. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing how people are getting excited. And people always suggest that, you know, with her, there's the amount of enthusiasm that plays a role in, you know, her prospects in November. But Republicans seem more accepting of Kamala than they were of Joe Biden. Yeah. And I think part of it, even though she was a politician, she wasn't a politician for nearly as long. Right. She was, what, two or four years as being a senator, then she'd be four years of being a vice president. Right. She hasn't been in politics for even a decade. Joe Biden was in the Senate, you know, 30 years or something close. Four, and then 40, he was 50 eight, years. Yeah, then he was eight years as vice president, and he ran for president three or four different times, you know, where Vice President Kamala Harris, you know, she ran in 2020, dropped out, and got selected as the VP nod. I think that plays a little bit of a role. But she also just comes off like a person. I was thinking about this the other day, and I remember being told in school, you know, anybody can grow up to be president of the United States. Right. And I think you kind of get that feel back with Kamala Harris. She talks about working at McDonald's and growing up middle class and struggling to grow up, you know, with how her family struggled. And I think people are excited about that idea that it's finally somebody who understands the middle class struggle. Not that Joe Biden didn't, but because he was so old, people are like, well, he grew up so, so long ago. He's got he's so out of touch. Right. Right. That's true. Well, you know, it's funny that phrase, anybody can grow up to be president. It applies to both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, just with different emphasis with Kamala Harris. Anybody can be president. Anybody can grow up to be president. Donald Trump is any motherfucker can be president. Exactly. And that and that's the difference. I mean, it's 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 a sad state of this country knowing that we elected him one time, let alone the prospect of, of two. Um it's the one thing I always hear people say, and I think it's a bullshit cop out comment. They say, Well, you know, Kamala. We don't know much about her. People just want to know more about her. We didn't know shit about Donald Trump, clearly, because we found out a lot of shit since that time. So they say we don't know enough about Kamala, but don't we know enough yet about Donald Trump? I think we got it all pretty much laid out, and it's all bad. It is a bullshit argument. The people who say that we don't know enough about Kamala are looking for an excuse to not vote for her and to justify them voting for Donald Trump, despite what they know about it. Like they know enough to say, we don't want that guy, but they're looking for any reason to to make it okay in their mind to 
do that to vote for him like well i don't know enough about her so i gotta go with the guy i know enough about right even if it's horrible and it's despicable right uh i wanted to vote for her but i just know more about donald trump and the fact of the matter is is if you know enough about donald trump and you still decide to vote for him you are a fucking racist despicable motherfucker i mean i i've heard people um say uh just because i'm voting for donald trump you can't call me a racist. Uh, yeah, I can't because you're supporting a known racist. You're supporting a racist contingent in MAGA. If you support it, as far as I'm concerned, you're as bad as being a racist. You can tell me you're not, but you're supporting one. So fuck you. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're known for what they are. I mean, look what they're doing with Springfield, Ohio. And Donald Trump coming out and saying he was going to deport everybody, oh, all the Haitian immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, legal or not, and deport them to Venezuela. You know, the, we will talk about both these subjects because they're all at the top of the top of the fold in the papers if we still had papers. But Donald Trump came out um, yesterday and was talking about this second assassination attempt. And we don't even know that it was an assassination attempt. We presume it is but there's a lot of weird stuff about it. The, the, the assailant didn't fire a shot. Thankfully, uh, secret service was there, but Donald Trump came out and said, the reason uh, people are, are trying to take pot shots at him is because of the uh, rhetoric that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are spewing, which is ironic when he's continuing to spew false rhetoric proven false rhetoric about Springfield, Ohio. And we've got Haitian immigrants there that who are there perfectly legal hiding in their homes because they fear for their safety. I mean, the audacity of it all, the projection of it all, it's fucking ridiculous. Oh yeah. I mean, it's completely ridiculous, but Donald, that's how what Donald Trump is. Every accusation is a projection and a confession, right? That's, that's how he is. If he's accusing them of doing something, odds are he's doing it. He accused Joe Biden of cheating in the 2020 election, yet we find out he cheated. And, you know, he called the Secretary of State in Georgia, asked him to find votes, all this stuff. Like, we find out how bad he was trying to cheat that election. But he accuses everybody else. And I think part of it is, maybe he's not this bright. I don't know. Maybe I'm giving him too much credit. But I think part of the reason why he's making those accusations is because he assumes, well, if I'm doing it, they must be doing it, too. Yeah, like he kind of maybe he to justifies that. it to himself that way. Yeah, that's that's not out of the realm of possibility. And of course, then Donald Trump. One of the reasons why uh, this whole assassination attempt, um, he's like every narcissist. Now he's looking to gain favor or sympathy from people. Uh, and, and and the thing about it is, he may be getting that from the base. But just like the first time around, anybody else that wouldn't normally vote for Donald Trump, it doesn't cause them to switch, switch their attitudes. They all say the same thing. It was rigged. It was uh, staged. Now, whether that's true or not doesn't make a difference because these people believe it. And that doesn't give give him any favor or any votes. He doesn't gain anything from it. Uh, but because he's looking for this sympathy, uh, somebody says, well, you got to be sympathetic that this poor guy's getting shot at. And I say, no, I'm not. Because the moment, the moment, moments after he, the shot was, well, there was no shot, but the moment after they found out this guy existed and was presumably looking to shoot him, Donald Trump said, well, can I at least finish the hole? And then within hours after leaving the, the, the golf course, you know, in this, in his uh, brigade of security, he immediately started trying to fundraise off of it. So I have a little sympathy for somebody who doesn't really give a shit and makes me question why he's not worried. Because if I knew people were shooting at me or wanted to shoot at me, I'd be a little nervous. So I just say what J.D. Vance and Donald Trump have said. J.D. Vance said, you know, shit happens. It's just the way things are now. You got to deal with it. And like Donald Trump told some parents from a school shooting, you really need to get over it. So, Donnie, this is just what happens. You need to get over it. Uh, him making the comment to the parents of after the school shooting was from one here in Iowa. Right, right, exactly. That was here in Iowa. and he, It was 
less than an hour away from me, actually, where that happened. And, you know, close enough that we were talking about it the day it happened. And D Donald Trump comes out and says, yeah, you just got to get over it. it it's, it's just a basically a fact of life. You got to get over it. No, we shouldn't. And but he should get over this. Yeah, there wasn't actually a shot fired. And I think this one might have been <laughs> like the other one. I almost hate to say it, but it seems like it's staged. If it was anybody else, yeah. I wouldn't say that. No. But you got the fact that it took Secret Service the first time to get four or five minutes to get him, you know, out of the area, into an armored vehicle. He was worried about his shoes and all that stuff that, you know, and his ear looks fine for something that was supposedly hit by a bullet. Yeah. And then now you have this one where there was a gunman pointing a gun in his vicinity or at his golf course toward the next hole at least where he was going to be heading and he's like well can i go finish that hole yeah what like how do you know there's not another one none of it makes sense and then you had the fundraising he was fundraising almost immediately off of both of them almost like he had a form letter ready to, i don't emails don't take that long to to get ready to go and to send but it was almost like he had the form letter ready to go to yeah. send almost immediately after yeah, it, 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 it's all very weird. And if later down the road we find out that there was some kind of backroom help to making this happen, and it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy for me to say that. But again, nothing is too crazy when Donald Trump is involved. He's done some pretty fucking crazy shit. And it, it's, it's conceivable. But, you know, Donald Trump tries to blame the libtards for this. It's all the libtards' fault. My point of this is is something, I don't know if it comes from the Bible or whoever, but it's violence begets violence. If you are a violent, dark-ass person, that's what's going to come back to you. And when you look at the Republican mm -hmm. Party right now, it's kind of like the difference between night and day between the Democrats and the Republicans. And people just don't, they aren't attracted to that. They've had enough of that. Yeah, you're right. And even the Republicans themselves are saying, hey, we got to do something the Ma like they can see the MAGA movements dying out. Even the even the hard Ma some of the hard MAGA members, they're trying to, for the most part, tone down their stuff. You got Marjorie Taylor Greene trying to call out Laura Loomer, you know, this year. But yeah. two years ago, she would have been side by side with Laura Loomer saying the exact same stuff. Right. Now, I heard something, I saw it on TikTok, and I wouldn't believe anything on TikTok necessarily unless I knew the person who was saying it. And the person saying it was chasing Oz. And I do tend to trust her because she's pretty solid in the things she talks about. I haven't checked into it any further. Donald Trump went off and said, nah, I don't really even know her. I think some of the stuff she says is crazy which is crazy in the first place because Laura Loomer is one of those crazy girlfriends that will go off half cocked and tell everybody everything and burn you fucking to the ground. But, but she said that while all this shooting stuff is going on, apparently Laura Loomer has been uh, banned from being near Donald Trump and being on the airplane. Now, I don't know if that's true, but if that did happen, I have a feeling Laura is going to have something to say about it. She's not going to be happy about it. So what was the reason she was banned from the airplane? Was it because Donald oh. Trump was trying to protect her or because he's worried she was somehow involved? Well, no, I don't know that she he thought she was involved. I just think the people around him um, told him, we don't want anything to do with her. And he brought her in anyway. And then when it started to hit the fan in the news, Donald finally realized, oops, fucked up. I mean, she says some horribly racist things, and he's got enough problems with racism. I think the people around him just said, look, see, she's fucking it up for you. You got to get rid of her. And Donald Trump's transactional. When he can get something for it, he takes it. If it's not working or it hurts him, then he cuts him off at the knees. So I don't know if that actually happened. I'm going to check into it tomorrow and see what what the situation is with Laura Loomer. But I, I, I will tell you this. I bet you we hear less from Laura Loomer henceforth because they finally realized that they just now realized that her saying racist things is bad for Donald Trump. 
I don't know why they didn't think of that beforehand, but they just now realized it. Well, I think they, I think some of them knew it ahead of time, but like with everything else, you can't convince Donald Trump of anything. You got to convince him of which way you want him to think. Like you, you can't tell him, you know, oh, she's going to be bad for your campaign if he thinks otherwise. Right. You got to get him to come to that conclusion, whether it's by saying, hey, you know, if you keep her around, you're going to look like a real loser if I keep by having her around. And see, there's all these negative headlines. Like you have to almost show him how bad it is because yeah. he won't, he's not smart enough to come to con- rational conclusions alone. No, he's not. He he's got to he, he's got to be that dumb kid who touches the stove over and over again to remember the fucker's hot, and uh, he's not very bright. And and he was starting to feel the pressure coming back from uh, um, uh, the press regarding her and Laura Loomer, and uh, I think he finally realized it. I think what happened was the people around him. We're starting to have to tell him things he didn't want to hear, even though they were true. Things aren't going well for you, Donald, and here's why. He didn't want to hear that. So he, against the best wishes of the people around him, he brings in Laura Loomer because Laura Loomer will tell him whatever the fuck he wants to hear. He doesn't care if it's the truth as long as it's what he wants to hear, and that's what she was providing. She He also liked the fact that she was kind of a pit bull. She'd go after anybody and say fucking anything. And that's Donald Trump's stock and trade. Remember, he had uh, um, that lawyer way back when, Cohn, Roy Cohn. That's how he was. He was a despicable human being who just attacked people. And he thinks his people should be attacking other people. But he's got some relatively normal people around him. They're just not willing to do it. So he needed his Roy Cohn. He's as much as said that before. Where's my Roy Cohn? Well, Roy... Roy Cohen, uh, as far as I remember, was the creepiest motherfucker on the planet, and he died a horrible death. So good luck, uh, good riddance to that motherfucker. Well, there's that. And then there's also, you, like you said, he's transactional. Well, if he was getting something else out of the deal, I know there's a story going around that they might have been, you know, doing Benoodling. extracurriculars. And I'm trying to imagine. I'm trying to imagine a 78-year-old man somehow in weird ways being sexual. I just, I don't, I'm 64, and I know the troubles and the hurdles you go through when you're 64. 78, this motherfucker's not healthy. I don't know. And and he's wearing a dirty diaper. I mean, it's a little hard to be sexy under those conditions. But, you know, even if it wasn't, who knows what they were doing, but this isn't the first woman that was around him a lot yeah, for a while who was younger and attractive and the speculation starts. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, Eric, you've been in Iowa too fucking long. (laughs) You can't tell me Laura Loomer's attractive. She's a ghoulish looking creepy bitch. Oh yeah, you're probably right. I I was being maybe a little bit too generous there, but yeah. uh, Probably about as attractive as he's going to get. Well, yeah. But um, young, much younger and, you know, was around. But it's not the first woman that's been that way. You had no. Carrie Lake. She was hanging around and she was supposedly earlier this year for a while staying at Mar-a-Lago when he was there. You know, right. and the rumors started flying. Then all of a sudden that was the end of what you heard heard there. And then when Marjorie Taylor Greene was going through the divorce, there were some rumors flying there. Because she was really buddy buddy with Donald Trump at that point, I wouldn't be surprised if there is something to that rumor. Oh, and yeah. once he realizes that he's getting negative press from it, when somebody says, "Hey, you know, you're looking pretty bad from doing this," you know, he's going to say, "Even that extracurricular activity isn't worth it, whatever it might be." And you know, then he cuts them loose, and now like. There's the infighting between Marjorie Taylor Greene and Laura Loomer. Well, the girls are fighting. They both want his attention. You know You know what I think it is, too? I mean, you're a young man. And, and one of the things that I've uh, realized as I've gotten older, when you're a young man, the concept of sex or the idea of sex is more prevalent on your mind than when you get older. It's weird because, you know, every 20 seconds a guy thinks about sex. And while Donald Trump may have that, propensity 
I think it has more to do with somebody just kowtowing to him, complimenting him. He likes the perception of a younger woman uh, fawning over him. It may not even be to the point of sexual sexuality, because I don't know that he has the capability to be anything like that. Again, you know, if you, if you, if you're trying to seduce a woman and, and you have an incredibly dirty diaper, that's a problem that doesn't add to the uh, seduction, if you will, but he does need somebody close to him to pat him on the head, pat him on the butt and say, God damn it, Donnie, you're a genius. And I think these women are willing to do that. Yeah. And I think they get through to him better than anybody else ever would, yeah. especially a younger woman. Um, and without having Melania around to even fill that role, you know, because the aides could have used her to say, hey, just go tell him this, you know, and she could have walked up to him and said anything. And he probably would have been more receptive of it coming from her. I just think that's the type of person he is. Yeah. Well, and she's young enough to be his granddaughter. I mean, I have I'm I'm 64 and I have a, a son that's 30, 31. So, I mean, it's it, the whole thing was pretty ridiculous. I want to talk about the uh, whole thing in Ohio. This is really gotten out of hand and um, the Republicans are kind of like a pit bull who's grabbed onto something and no matter how detrimental it is to them they refuse to release it and this whole thing started this this eating pets in Springfield started out in some Facebook thing that some woman heard from a friend of a friend it had no validity at all when they grabbed onto it um is when Donald Trump was kind of in desperation mode. You remember it was during the debate and Kamala was being successful in burying that motherfucker and really hyping him up. And he got kind of into overdrive. And when narcissists do that, they will grab at anything and everything. And they'll say something. And if that doesn't work, they'll ramp it up. If that doesn't work, they'll ramp it up. And he got to the point in that debate where he had nothing left. He was out of bullets. So he just pulled that out of thin air and said, oh, they're eating the pets. They're eating the cats. They're eating the dogs. And that set off a firestorm. Of course, it incited all the dumb Trump fucks to go to Springfield, Ohio, and cause all kinds of problems. Uh, but now that it's been proven that it's not true, the mayor has said it, the governor has said it, everybody said it, there's no validity to it. He and uh, J.D. Vance and everybody around him keep doubling down. I mean, how shameful is that? You you can be proven wrong and you still keep doubling down. Oh, yeah. But this whole they're eating pets thing, this has been a Republican talking point for decades really about immigrants i've heard it for decades maybe not oh. haitian immigrants but you you used to hear the running joke that when you went to eat at a chinese restaurant you were eating cat that's true you're right you know i remember 10 years ago seeing something on facebook of a supposed image of a chinese restaurant with you know the backside of a chinese restaurant where they had a bunch of empty cat carriers like two dozen sitting there yeah, oh yeah. see they just got a fresh supply it's been a running thing, never to this level. Right. But that's what but that's also why these Republicans were able to latch on to it so hard, these conservative Trump fucks, because they've been hearing about it for decades that these immigrants of varying nationalities do that. And it's also a way of just making anybody who comes in from anywhere else seem like the other, like, oh, they're so different from us. They can't possibly be here and be up to any good. Well, and, and it illustrates perfectly how Donald Trump's standard fare is to incite people to violence. We mm -hmm. know he and Rudy Giuliani did it with the election uh, workers in Georgia. We know Donald Trump did it on January 6th, 2021, with the insurrection and the attack on the Capitol by his Trump fucks. And now in this situation, I mean, I talked to Old Soul, and Old Soul is a very sensitive person. And when she hears this injustice, like what's going on in Ohio, she gets very upset. I think a lot of people get very upset about it. But these are Haitian immigrants who are there on work visas. They're needed in this town because they had a lack of workers. So they're filling a role, and they're helping the town to do better. They have done absolutely nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong. They aren't illegals. Um, 
And this guy says this, and now every dumb Trump will fuck in America is calling in uh, bomb bomb threats and threatening people's lives, and they got factions of the Klan roaming the streets, and these poor people have to lock themselves down in their houses just so they can feel safe. That's not how fucking America is. No, it's not supposed to be. But then you also have J.D. Vance going out on CNN yesterday morning. Yes. And admitting he made up the story. He goes, well, I created it. I created this story to get you guys talking about our immigration problem. And when Dana Bash pushed him, he was like, you create, you just said you created it. And then he paused. And it was a long pause. Like, oh, shit, I did. Like, it looked like you could kind of see the gears turning. They were turning slow, but they were turning He's like, well, the story came from my constituents. And, and, you know, when I say created it, I created the media buzz around the story. And he tried to spin it, but the damage was done. He admitted yeah. they, they fabricated this whole story. Yeah, he, he was made to look like a fool. When she finally pressed him on it, he sat there, like you say, he paused and he goes, what? <laughs> Trying to buy some time and it just wasn't going to work. That's the thing that amazes me is you've got somebody like, J.D. Vance, educated in the Ivy League. Uh, you got Elon Musk, uh, who's supposed to be one of the smarter people in the world. And these two couldn't be fucking dumber. They keep doing things. They keep stepping on their own dicks. I think part of it is that these two both, whether they're smart or not, they're both socially awkward. And uh, they, they do things that they think is going to play well or that they think they can get away with, and it just doesn't happen. You know, telling Taylor Swift, well, I'll come and give you a baby. Yeah, no, that's that's not going to work. Uh, saying the things he says about Kamala, and of course, J.D. Vance with him just riding this wave of this lie. You would think if they were that smart, they'd say, you know, this is going to cost me in the end. I better not do it. But instead, they just do it harder. Well, the problem is, they're equating like book intelligence and they may be very, you know, book smart, but they are not socially smart. They're not street smart. They have no social awareness. Those two things are not interchangeable. No. And it doesn't, doesn't matter how actually smart you are as far as like book smart. If you don't have social awareness and you're not so, you know, you don't have street smarts and so, and, concepts of what to do in like polite society it doesn't matter like you're going to come off weird and creepy like jd vance does you're going to say the stupid things and think you're doing something and you're not all you're doing is pissing people off because it, it doesn't work right and this may be the strongest thing that kamala harris and tim walls have they are 180 degrees opposite of these guys because they are very socially adept they aren't weird People relate to them, especially Tim Walls in many cases. Um, they may not have the pedigree that these guys have or the money that these guys have, but they have the most important thing you need when you're in sales or politics or corporate America, the ability to interact with people, the ability to get people to trust you and like you. Neither one of these motherfuckers, Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump Elon Musk, or J.D. Vance has that capability. They... People are repulsed by them, and that's not the case with Kamala and Tim. Oh, exactly. Like, you know, hearing about Donald Trump wanting to put Elon Musk in his cabinet, that's just ridiculous, and that's going to piss people off. You know, look at what Elon Musk did with Twitter. Took a good company that was making a lot of money, worth a lot of money, and ran it down the shitter. You know, Donald Trump has ran how many businesses into the shitter, you know, and, and bankrupted everything he's touched. Right. You know, doing these things, it's they people just don't relate to them on any level. And you have Kamala Harris and Tim Walls who come out, they speak very genuine. They speak, even though, yes, Donald Trump speaks at a lower grade level, Kamala Harris and Tim Walls speak in a very plain way. Yeah. Like an everyday person. They don't, they, they use better words and they, they get their point across much better, but they're also speaking still like an everyday person without sounding dumb. 
Well, the big thing they have going over Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, when you hear Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, oh, this country shit, everything about the things they say are negative or dark. Everything that Kamala and Tim says, there's hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel. We can do this. It's positive. And after living in 10 years of this darkness that Donald Trump has cast upon us, people are fucking tired of it. They want some happiness back in their life. They're entitled to some happiness. And the only option there is Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, because everything Donald Trump says is fucking draconian and dark. Exactly. And when you hear, oh, we're on the way to a third world country, or like what he said about, oh, if you elect Kamala Harris, we're on our way to a 1929 style depression, even though nothing is indicating that at all. But when, when you see that kind of stuff and people talk like, Yes, there's always been negative, there's been mudslinging in politics, but never to as far of an extreme as Donald Trump likes to take the negative side. And people are just sick of it. Yeah, yeah. It, well, you know, the thing about it is, is these people that follow Donald Trump, you know, normally they're pretty innocuous. Nobody knows who they are. Uh, but because they follow this fucking clown, they end up exposing themselves. Like, for example... In uh, Portage County in Ohio, the sheriff, Bruce Zakowski, told his followers to write down the addresses of people who put Harris wall signs in their front lawns so that he could drop off undocumented immigrants at their residence. When people ask me what's going to happen if the flip-flopping laughing hyena wins, Zakowski, who took office in 2021, I say, write down all the addresses of the people who had their signs in their yard. So when the illegal human locust, which she supports, need places to live, will already have the addresses of the new families who supported their arrival. How long do you think this motherfucker is going to be in his job? This dumb motherfucker Hopefully has the audience. Long. He gets caught up in his feels and he starts spewing stuff because he's angry and he can't control his emotions. This motherfucker's going to get fired. I guarantee you he's getting fired. Yeah, well, and it, I don't know how that county does it. I know around here you elect your sheriff. And, right. you know, usually I think it's a four-year term. Well, he'd be due up any time now. Yeah. He's probably going to be up for election, and he's probably going to get beat based on his own words. If, if, if the county doesn't fire him beforehand. Yeah, if, you know, you can fire him for cause, I would imagine. And that would be fucking cause. You know, instilling fear and inciting some potential violence and being racist. You know, I would think uh, the city council or the county uh, board would want to get rid of a motherfucker like this. I mean, he's not helping matters for the upcoming election. And with all these people talking this shit, I think this is why we're seeing states that wouldn't normally be considered potentially blue going blue, because I think people are really... They might be scared, but I think they're just sick and tired of the fucking negativity and the ridiculousness. Yeah, I think you're right. I've been saying for a while, mostly because of the abortion issue and some of the other problems. But I think you've got uh, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Texas and Florida all potentially could be in play. Yeah. And those are just the ones I can think of that have abort that you know, have abortion measures or have issues with major issues with Republican leadership. I mean, with all these issues with Ohio, J.D. Vance could have just put Ohio in play and could deliver Ohio to Kamala Harris because of Springfield. You know, I, I'm not going to say that for sure it's going to happen, but unlike previous elections, when you talk about Missouri, Iowa, um, Florida, Texas, and even Ohio, like you say, it's at least in the conversation. It's never been in the conversation before that they could possibly go blue, but because of how badly Donald Trump has been uh, done and uh, the, the, the MAGA around him, they've pushed these states to the point where they go, is it crazy or is it the party I don't particularly like? Do we save democracy or do we destroy democracy? And I don't think even the most rabid conservative is going to back Donald Trump if he believes or she believes that it's going to destroy democracy. Because if that happens, you can be conservative all day, every day, what you want. You're never going to get what you want because you allowed that motherfucker to be the president. Exactly. Like I, like you and I have both been saying, 
uh, we need to, you know, look at it. Like, how can you vote for somebody like Kamala Harris and, you know, or not vote for Kamala Harris because she supports abortion, I should say, but then vote in your state that has an abortion amendment and say, I'm voting to support abortion access amendment. That doesn't make sense. Like you no. can't, I don't know how people are going to split their vote. I think you're going to see big turnout in a lot of these states where either there's been an abortion ballot measure or a recent change. And that's why I put Iowa in play the minute the Iowa Supreme Court said that the abortion law could go into effect with two months to go to the election. Right. I'm like, that's a recent change. People are going to remember and people are going to be pissed. They are going to be pissed. Yeah. Did you hear about Nebraska? No. Nebraska Supreme Court has ruled, um, as far as the abortion amendment issue goes, there are going to be competing abortion measures on the ballot in Nebraska. One, putting the ban that they currently have in place into the Constitution, the other allowing it. They're both on the ballot this November. Wow. Wow. That's well, and we heard about North Dakota too. The Supreme Court is it North Dakota that said um, you can't ban abortion here, and and now there's no abortion clinics in North Dakota. The closest one is in Moorhead, Minnesota, which is right on the border. Um, but that's interesting. I think they're going to come back with another retooled bill uh, so they can get it passed, but. There's been a lot of pushback against this abortion thing. And I think as we get closer to the election, people are realizing the vast majority of the people don't support abortion bans. And they're finally realizing they're going to pay a price if they stand behind it. Yeah, because they, they're they realizing that most of the talking points that we've been hearing, and that I know I have been hearing myself going back 20 plus years, the late term abortions, the women waiting till the last minute. Oh, don't want to be, don't want a baby anymore, even though I'm two days away from my due date and getting an abortion. Like all that's nothing but bull. And people are realizing it in part because of TikTok. Well, uh, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff, but primarily TikTok. TikTok has taken the lead as for, as far as providing information to people. I mean, there's a lot of folks on TikTok, me, you, old, uh, not old soul, uh, chasing Oz, uh, Hawk. Uh, there's a ton of people that are very smart that are, are, are giving information that you can't get from the fucking media. And, uh, it's finding, it's finding a bullseye with these people. People are listening and they're believing and they're getting angry about this stuff. I personally think the, um, mainstream media after this election is going to have a lot of problems. People will realize that they lied to them uh, or at least manipulated them. If Kamala wins big in November, the question needs to be asked of every mainstream media. How come Eric and I won, Mike in Minnesota knew, and you motherfuckers didn't? You got all the money, you got all the resources, resources and research, but you didn't know. Fact is, they do know they're fucking with people's heads. Yeah, I mean, they're they're running the stories they want to run. They're talking about the events they want to talk about. I've had numerous people talking to me about this. Uh, was it Moreno, the Republican senator for Ohio? Right. That or the guy that's running to replace uh, was it Sherrod Brown? Is that it? Right. Right. Yeah. In Ohio. And apparently there was some information coming out about him. I've been trying to find what this information was supposedly going to be. I haven't found much outside of a few small networks. But uh, people were asking me about that. And it was supposed to be coming out around the same time that uh, J.D. Vance went on the news networks and said, yeah, I created it all. I, I created the story. And then suddenly that, you know, that became the big talking point. And then you had later the same day you had this gunman show up at Mar or at Mar-a-Lago, uh, Trump International in West Palm Springs. Like they ran those stories and then this other story gets buried and forgotten about and not talked about, which could yeah. be more important or at least as important. What, what I understand about this Moreno guy, uh, apparently it's some financial scandal, not unlike George Santos. And, you know, they want to keep that under under the radar so that he still has a chance against Sherrod Brown. I don't think he does because he's one of the crazy uh, um, 
the crazy Trump Lafux, and they don't do well in elections. I don't know if you heard this one about Byron Donald, about pulling all Project 2025 uh, uh, commercials from the swing states. They're really still trying to separate themselves from Project 2025, and they can't. It's sticking to them like fucking glue. In, yeah, it is. In part, once they once it got out there and the main a little bit of the mainstream media was talking about it and some major political people were talking about it, then more and more creators like yourself and a little bit of, of me and the bigger creators, you know, that we've mentioned already were talking about it. And suddenly people like, oh, oh, shit, this thing's actually real. This isn't just something they made up, though. No, there's no. a 900 page document and it's bad. And it's sticking because people are talking about it. And despite they them wanting to pull ads or whatever, it's not going to work because there's too many people talking about it now. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 it's one of those things that took off like wildfire and there's no, uh, no one hearing it for a lot of folks. People understand how horrible and egregious it is and how it, you know, Donald Trump will try to say that he has nothing to do with it. But the fact of the matter is most of his staff that was with him during his presidency now work for the Heritage uh, or Heritage Corporation or Project 2025. Everything Donald Trump is espousing is also in Project 2025. I mean, you can like like Judge Judy once said, who's a Trump humper, too. So I hate her fucking guts. But like she said, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. That's what Donald Trump is essentially doing. Uh, don't believe what you see or hear. Just believe what I tell you. And you've got to be a special kind of stupid to even at this late date to to buy into that. So that's why I'm thinking it's only the base. Even the, uh, the, the moderates or the independents aren't buying this shit anymore. They're getting tired of it. Yeah, I think you're right. Now, we might have had a little bit more to worry about with joe biden in the race i still think we would have gotten a big chunk but i think at this point donald trump's going to be lucky to get 30 to 35 percent of the popular vote nationwide he'll probably still win a bunch of states because of the electoral college but i think popular vote he's only going to really get the majority of his base yeah it's 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 going to be far worse than the the media will will lead you to believe. And people say, how can you say that? I said, well, instead of looking at polls and getting all emotional about it, I've said it before, you've got Donald Trump, who is absolutely the worst presidential candidate in the history of this country based on all the baggage he has. He takes credit for overturning Roe v. Wade, alienating 50% of this country or taking away constitutional rights away from 50% of the country and alienating 75% of the country that support Roe v. Wade. Then you got all the criminal activity and all the crazy shit. You can't possibly, um, you can't possibly suggest that people are that dumb to continue voting for this guy. He's just a, he's just a mess. And, and, and conversely, you've got Kamala Harris, who may be the most popular presidential candidate in history, just based on that information, please tell me how Donald Trump even gets close. Yeah. I mean, I don't see it, but like you were talking about polls and we started off talking about this poll for, out of Iowa. Yeah. Like I said in my TikTok talking about it, I'm like, I don't trust the polls. I still don't trust this poll. But it, it it's backing what I'm already seeing and what I've already been talking about. You know, and I think that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the polls starting to kind of reflect what you and I are saying and what other people are saying. You know, they, uh, th you know, these people there that get polled, they're, um, you know, we don't know who they are or whatever. But they're sick of this shit. The ones that are saying, yeah, you know, we're not dealing with Donald Trump anymore. And I just think if, if the polls are even going in this one direction, it just guarantees it's going to be horrible, a horrible outcome for Donald Trump. Yeah, the, 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 there, there is no question in my mind. And I'm looking forward to that day on November 5th or 6th when I can say what I said before. Where the fuck was the mainstream media? Why did you continue to push this bullshit on the people? And they'll say, well, we just didn't want people to to get lazy and not go out and vote. We were push, <clears throat> And people have said that to me. Don't be so positive because people just won't go out and vote. I have a lot more respect for the people who listen to this show 
we know what we need to do. No one's going to sit on their laurels. If they if they take the time to listen to this show, they're fucking serious about this shit. They're nervous about this shit. They're going to do their job. Just because I tell you it's going to be okay doesn't mean you're going to go, well, I don't have to vote now. I refuse to believe that of the people who listen to this show or even to me on TikTok. Well, you, exactly. And as far as like people like you and me being positive or whatever, that's different. The media... Them saying, well, we didn't want people to, to get too positive and not turn out to vote. That's not the media's job. No. It's their job is to report things that are true. Yeah. And to tell us what's going on in the world. And I know you're never, no matter what, even if you went back to Walter Cronkite, as, who was probably one of the best journalists or reporters there was. Most there trusted. Was still at least, there was at least some spin in what he said. Maybe not a lot. But everybody's going to have at least a little bit. I'm smart enough to know that. Yeah, that's but, true. Uh, but it's not their job to tell us, you know, oh, it's going to be so, it's close, it's close, you know, and keep this narrative going just so we're scared to turn up and vote. No, they need to tell us the facts so we know how bad this guy is. Absolutely. Etc. Absolutely. You know, so you can make that informed choice. Absolutely. Uh, well, let's let's take a quick break uh, and uh, we'll be right back. We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast. Eric from Iowa is with us. You know, Eric, I was watching MSNBC and they had a Republican strategist on there. And uh, of course, he was expounding on the great possibilities for Donald Trump. And somebody brought up the debate. And this is what he said. He said the debate... That's ancient history. Donald Trump's doing fine. I think there's positive things for Donald Trump because, you know, in 2016, at one point, he was down by 10 points and he went on to victory. And, and, and the thing about it is, he said, nobody loses an election based on one debate. And I, I, I said, well, Joe Biden only had one debate, and they kicked him out of the fucking election. So I disagree that one debate doesn't have a serious impact. And secondly, if you're going to compare Donald Trump of 2016 to 2024, you're fucking delusional because Donald Trump is not the same candidate. This country is not the same place it was back then. We're in a separate parallel universe. You can't compare apples and oranges, and that's what that'll be. The question is, he says he doesn't want to do a debate, and that's probably wise on his part. But do you think he will? And do we even have enough fucking time to do it? I mean, we're less than two months. I think there there is a good chance there could be another debate, especially since Kamala Harris was willing to do it on Fox. And if Donald Trump could get Hannity or Ingraham or whoever the third one is he mentioned, there was another one that's very uh, – pro-Trump and very friendly and softballish to him. Um, but it doesn't matter where, what network they do it on or what venue. No. She's going to kick his ass. Um, but she might even kick Hannity. She it. might even kick, kick Hannity's ass in the process. <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd love to see that. But I think there could be a second debate. And I think as it goes on, if he figures out that he is losing as bad as what it sounds like and what we are thinking, if if his handlers can't, you know, convince him that he's doing so badly, you know, uh, I think he could end up agreeing it or, or agreeing with it. Like if he finds out that he's doing horrible, he may think he only has no other choice but to do another debate and try to talk his way back out of it and maybe try to do better. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he would like to try to redeem himself. My question is, what's in it for Kamala Harris to do another one? I mean, she soundly kicked his ass. She doesn't have anything to prove at this point. She will kick his ass again. Is it worth it? Is there any point to doing it? I mean, no, there's not a lot of uh, room to do it. But if she does it a second time, it does kill some of the talking points, especially if she does it on Fox. You know, yeah, they would kill some of the talking points. Oh, she had the questions in advance. Oh, she was wearing an earpiece. Like the one person put it, and like I, I mentioned in a, a comment, gee, it's not like you couldn't figure out that they were going to talk about the economy, about immigration, right. about the two wars that are ravaging around the world, about Russia. 
you know, the talk, the ideas were out there. Like it didn't take a genius to figure them out. Now, the other question would be, does Fox even want to do it? I mean, because they are criminal, corrupt motherfuckers on Fox, but they're not stupid. They understand the media. They understand what happened last time. They understand why Donald Trump failed. They know that Donald Trump's going to do the very same thing. Does this put Fox in a bad situation, especially if they're fucking trying to push Donald Trump and he gets destroyed on Fox News and in the process, maybe Hannity gets embarrassed because he's not... It's potential to do that. We've seen other people embarrass Hannity by the things he says, and Kamala may be the person to do it. I don't know if Fox News even wants to do it. I haven't heard how Fox would stand on it, but I think they could do it, especially if they're gullible enough to buy into the idea from Donald Trump potentially that well, fill fill the audience with with my supporters, and it'll look much better because they'll cheer for everything I say, and it'll make me look really, really good. You know, oh, you'll come out looking great in this because we'll throw her off her game or some bullshit. You know, if if they buy into any sort of spin like that, it's not what's going to happen. But they could believe it would happen, and then they're going to get embarrassed. <laughs> I mean, especially if they think that uh, it might lose them access to Donald Trump at some point between yeah. now and the election, they might buy. They might bite and do it. Well, and the other aspect of uh, of this for Fox is they know what happened on ABC. 67 million people watched that event, and they're all about money, and that's going to bring in a big crowd. I think they did limited advertising on it, but that would be very valuable advertising. You know, it's that Super Bowl-level shit. So they may do it just based on the money, but it may be ill-advised because they may come out of this looking very badly. Yeah, you're right. And beyond that, like, uh, you know, like you said, limited advertising, they only took two commercial breaks during the entirety of the debate. So those two ter ter commercial breaks were probably very, very valuable, very expensive. But with 67 million people watching, that's a lot of eyeballs. And if, even a few of them are new viewers that would maybe migrate to your network after that's something they would consider too. They could get loop, looped into this just out of pure pride and greed. Yeah, they could. Well, you know, after the debate, we looked at this and said, Oh, Kamala kicked his ass. What could be worse than this? And then, of course, shortly thereafter, we have this whole Springfield, Ohio thing. I know they think they're looking good, but they look horrible in this situation. This whole scam of them doubling and tripling down is hurting them very badly. That's the one thing about Donald Trump, whether there's a debate or not. Each week, there's bound to be something new that makes him look bad and makes more people hate or be fearful of him. Oh, definitely. He just keeps talking. and. As a lot of commenters I'm seeing on various videos, not just mine, but, you know, let him talk. Yeah. You've been saying it for a long time. Let, let the motherfucker talk because he's going to say it. Um, He's going to say some of the worst shit and it's going to blow up. I mean, I don't know how many videos I have seen with his audio of they're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats, they're eating the pets as reactions of people either either playing that audio and their pet reacting to it and looking all startled and surprised or them acting like they're cooking their pets or something. Yeah. It has blown up all over TikTok and it's not a good look for him. He well, looks like a crazy person. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable how badly this goes for him. Any other candidate, people would say, Oh, that motherfucker's done. What's that? Who was that candidate? that was excited at some event and he screamed and it sounded weird. And his career was pretty much over after that. I can't remember the guy's name. Oh God. I, I know who you're thinking of it. He had a weird. Yeah. Or yeah. something. Yeah. He had a little high um, pitch to it. And I can't remember his name. I should people. I, will write I want to say down. that was in. Was that in? Oh, that might've been. Oh, wait, was that in 16? No, I think, it was, I think it was 08, but it doesn't matter. And the, the point is, is that little thing pretty much sunk that guy's presidential campaign and career. And look at all the shit that's happened to Donald Trump. Now, part of the reason why it hasn't sunk his career, 
is because we have a party, the Republican Party, who's pretty much decimated at this point. They won't admit it, but they don't exist anymore. The Republican Party, Conservative Party. And, and I think a lot of people in the Republican Party are sensing this now. Yeah, we followed him all this long, but he's going to get beat and we aren't going to have a party left. So they, they, they've got to step away from him in these circumstances uh, just to save their own lives or save their own futures. And I think it's probably too late, to be honest with you, but they apparently don't grasp that. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty bad. I think almost all the politicians right now, there may be some that end up being safe, but I think in order for the Republican Party to come back around, we've talked about it a lot, I think they're going to have to rebrand they're going to, at the minimum, have to dump the craziest of them. You know, they're already working toward getting some of the batshit crazy ones out. Look at Marjorie Taylor Greene. There's Republicans against Green in Georgia right? trying to get her out. Um, you know, when Lauren Boebert won her primary in her new district, I commented she only won with, it was either 46 or 54 percent of the vote. Of the, of the Republican vote, the, the field was just too uh, spread. Well, yeah. if that many people don't like her, if they don't vote for her in the election, she loses right. and the Democrat gets in, you know, and that could happen. It's the Republicans are going to start weeding out the worst of them and try to bring in better candidates. But they may have to, as we've talked about before, just drop the Republican name altogether and, you know, come out with a new party. But if they do, it's going to be about 10 years before they get up and running. And even if they take over all of the infrastructure of the old Republican Party, because people just aren't going to trust them. No, it's going to take a while. And the thing about it is, is when you're talking about politics, we're talking about presidential elections, Senate races, uh, House races. The most important thing any party, especially the Republican Party, needs is unity. And there is no unity in it. These people that voted for Nikki Haley in the primaries instead of Donald Trump, they're not going to say, well, Donald Trump's a candidate now. They weren't voting for Nikki Haley. They were voting against Donald Trump. And when he is the nominee and he's running for the presidency, they are either going to vote Democrat or they're not going to vote. And either way, that's beneficial to the Democrats. Oh, exactly. I mean, you, you said there's no unity. Look at what they were going to try to do this week. Well, last week, I guess it was with the uh, the budget because you know, they got to pass a funding bill by the end of the month. Right. They wanted to attack that. Uh, well, the immigration thing with presenting your, your your citizenship proof in order to be able to, to vote. And Mike Johnson came back out and said, yeah, we're not voting on that this week. We need we need time to build a consensus because we, we don't have enough votes basically to pass it out of the out of the House. Well, they can only lose four or five votes. Their, part, their lead in the House is so small, they can't do anything. And since they're not unified, they can't they can't do it. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just uh, um, hold on a second here. I got a problem with my camera. I got that dumb looking picture in here. And <laughs> wow. Fix that. There we go. There we go. I Who took that? I took that picture. It's fucking dumb. <laughs> It's dumb. Uh, any, anyway, um, there's something coming up, and I wanted to talk to you about this. I've talked about it before on the podcast. Uh, we're always looking at the next big thing that's going to happen to Donald Trump. And we know that in nine days, a little over a week, September 26th, this is going to be a big day in court for Donald Trump. We know that he appealed the lawsuit from Letitia James to the tune of $450 million. He wanted to delay it and he got his wish. He got it appealed. Well, that appeal starts on September 26th. Opening arguments start. Now it'll be interesting to see how long this goes, if it goes long at all, because if he loses this appeal, I, the, I don't know what the next step for him, if there is another next step. I don't think the Supreme Court comes into play, the U.S. Supreme Court, because it's a lawsuit, for God's sake. It's not criminal. And even if it was able to go to the Supreme Court, it's a state issue. It's not a federal issue. So 
he could be very close to actually having to come out of his ass with $450 million. And that would be absolutely crippling to him because he won't be able to do it. And then much like Rudy Giuliani, Let Letitia James going to come take his shit. Well, now I thought it was the E. Jean Carroll one that was coming up on the 26th. I thought it was Letitia James, to be honest with you. That's a good question. Uh, I'll check it out. I mean, you might I'm be not right. saying you're wrong. I, just, I thought it was E. Jean Carroll. I thought it was the first E. Jean Carroll case. The um, five million. You may be right. I, I, I kept hearing it was uh, Letitia James. Let me see if uh, I can find out real quick here. But either way, no matter which one, I usually these appeals, especially if it's to the New York Court of Appeals, that's the highest court in New York, yeah. which means there's no appealing it after. When they rule, they rule. And a lot of times it's it, this isn't like a normal court case. They'll have oral arguments for a length of time. They usually set it for hour, hour and a half, two hours, however long they think they need. They talk for that long. And then that's it. That's the only time you get, they make their ruling and that is it. You're not present, you know, it's not, you're not going through the whole court case again. It's not going to be weeks. It's going to be one day. Yeah. Then we just got to wait for their decision. Right. Exactly. I, I was just looking for it. Now I don't know. You got me questioning what I, what, what, what's true. I guarantee you somebody listening to this podcast is going to go research crazy and they'll say, Mike, it was this. Please do that because I, 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 I thought it was regarding Letitia James case, but I could be wrong. Uh, but the other thing is even a bigger issue. I think uh, that is, and this one I know for sure that on September 26th, um, Jack Smith is going to file a brief regarding his superseding indictments. The one that he felt was a workaround to this whole um, immunity thing. You know, he got the immunity thing. Then he refiled or filed a uh, superseding indictment. But in that particular case, in this briefing, there's going to be more evidence against Donald Trump, seemingly more serious evidence to affect the immunity decision. And Donald Trump has been fighting like hell to not get this evidence revealed. But it's going to be revealed on 26th of September. And I don't know if you could classify that as an October surprise, but it's going to be a late September surprise because they definitely don't want that shit out there. Oh yeah. And then I, isn't that also where she's going to make a ruling based on some of this evidence or is she it's just her looking at it? No, I think you're right. Then I her think, ruling comes later. Well, I no, I think she may be doing it on the same day. And I think it was, you know, another one of Donald Trump's suggestions that they need to throw it out because of the immunity case. She has to make the decision on that. I, Based on what she said and the, her, her demeanor about this whole thing, she's not going to throw out the case, uh, especially since it's a new case now because we got new indictments. Um, I don't know. But that day is not going to be a fun day for Donald Trump. He's not looking forward to it. And I don't know that he can delay it any more than he already has. No. And He's been trying. He's been trying for delays for everything. And the problem is he is getting to the point where he has run out of time for these delays. He yeah. can't delay. He can't delay. Like he delayed his sentencing in uh, the Manhattan District's 34 felonies till after the election. And then but then he went to the U.S. Court of Appeals after the district court, federal district court said, no, we're not taking this court. He said, please save me state. Stay my sentencing till you know after all my appeals are done because I'm running for president. And they're like, yeah, your sentencing doesn't come up till after your the election's over. We're not helping you, right? You know he's running out of time for for delaying it. Once the election's over, they're not going to be as willing to grant him many more delays because there's no more big events coming. Right, he's not going to win the presidency. There, there's just no way he's winning this election. Well, and he attempted and, to appeal the gag order, too, and they just came back and said, no, nah, we're not dropping the gag order. The gag order is in effect until he gets sentenced. And he did this to himself. He doesn't want the gag order to get sentenced then. 
but they're going to keep the gag order in place until the sentencing. And, and, and to be perfectly honest, I've heard other people talk about this, the idea that um, Alvin Bragg and the judge were so easy to delay it till after the election, maybe a signal of what's to come. It would have been very difficult to sentence him to prison while he was a candidate for president. But after he's lost that election, no problem at all. He's citizen Donald Trump. He's got nothing to protect him. He's vulnerable now. And that may be a sign that Judge uh, uh, Marchand is willing to sentence him to, to, to prison. People will say, well, this, this particular crime uh, doesn't warrant prison. Well, he's got 34 of them. And all the other shit he pulled, violating the gag order over and over and over again, threatening the judge's daughter, threatening the judge, the witnesses, mm -hmm. the prosecution. You know, when it comes to sentencing, it's all about what the person's behavior is. Are they sorry for what they did? Do they own up to what they did? Donald Trump's done none of that. He is a prime prospect to be put in fucking jail. Yeah, Donald Trump will never admit to anything he's ever done. No, um, it's like the one meme I saw about the uh, the debate, and it says, "Tell me again how Kamala Harris wearing an, e an earpiece made Donald Trump say stupid shit." <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. you know, but that's the truth. It's it's the whole thing all all the way around. They want he, he's got this persecution complex or the, the everyone's out to get me complex or whatever. Nothing's ever his fault. Everything's always somebody else's fault. And the judge is going to look at that when he gets sentenced. And now you have more indictments in uh, D.C. You know, they, the judge is going to weigh that, that there's new charges out there against him, even though they're just rehashes of the old charges because of the immunity thing. The judge is going to look at that. He's going to look at how he's been acting. You have the potential criminality involving Arlington. That's potentially a federal crime. Again, judge is going to look at at least that potentially and say, you know, you have been continuing to do things that even if you haven't been charged are crimes. It's better for society for you to not be out in public. Right. Somebody else told me something, too. And I don't know if this is true. If you've been convicted of a crime and you're then tried for another crime, because you've already, been, so say he gets into the January 6th thing after the election, somebody has told me that if you have been convicted of a crime and uh, you go on trial for a new set of crimes, which he will do three more times, that they can't let you out on bail. I don't know that that's true, but it makes some sense. If he's already convicted of crimes, you can't say, "Well, we'll let you go out because maybe, maybe you're you're uh, you're 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 innocent," because he's already been convicted of fucking crimes. So it may be conceivable that after the election, when he's got no protection and he goes on trial for one of these other three cases, they may have to put him in jail. Yeah, that's entirely possible. I don't know if that the way you described it is actually the way that works or not. I'm not sure. I don't. But I, I do know. I heard that, somebody like, say it and I liked it, so I grasped it. But I don't know yeah. that it's true. But I do know, like, a lot of times they will look at your past history. And if you've got a lot of convictions for stuff, you know, they take that into account when they consider whether or not you get bail, whether you have to stay in prison pending trial whether you know whether or not they're going to give you probation for that particular crime or they're going to give you the six months the year whatever whatever jail sentence you're going to get they look at all of that and you know they do take that all into consideration well and and the thing about it is is there is no obligation of any judge to let you out on bail they don't have to let you out on bail if Donald Trump is no longer running for president, what's the reason to let him out on bail if he's clearly a, a habitual criminal? He's a habitual criminal. And based on his own uh, talking, you know, his own words, he's a flight risk. He talked yeah. about running to Venezuela. I mean, that alone should be enough to revoke his bail after the election. And I think the reason it hasn't happened yet is none, none of the district attorneys or the 
attorney generals or anybody that's doing any of these cases want to bring that motion before the election because it would look political. But day after the election, or if they wait all the way until uh, January 6th when it's certified, and they might do that just for appearances sake, one of them might say, hey, you know what? He was talking about fleeing to Venezuela. We need him remanded. And that's if Judge Marchand doesn't already have him in a, in a jail cell with his sentencing in late November. Well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it doesn't have to be the state cap or the U.S. Capitol. If you incite violence, that's against the law, against anybody, against a bar, against whatever. Now, when Jack Smith is presenting his case or the January 6th insurrection, he's got to be able to go back to, well, look what he did in Ohio. These people were completely innocent. He incited violence because violence occurred and oppression occurred because of what he said. So don't tell me you didn't do it in January 6th when you're still fucking doing it. You know, that's entirely possible. I hadn't considered that. But it, while it might not be enough to prove his guilt for the January 6th. No, it won't. It, but it'll shade the whole thing going into but it. It'll, it'll shade it and it can show... Um, a pattern it can show, you know, especially when he didn't really decry the violence. He hasn't he hasn't said don't do it. He kind of, he even doubled down and said, well, I'm going to deport these people. Blah blah blah. Right. So he he it, he makes it sound like he's on in support of all the violence against them. That you know you can use that to say, hey, these are the effects of his words here, and he didn't do anything there either. You know, so when he said these things, he intent. You can kind of maybe use it to frame his intent. For what he was doing in 2021. Well, Jack Smith has got a plethora of things he can lay out to show a pattern. He did the very same thing to the uh, election uh, workers in Georgia. He incited, mm -hmm. he, he incited violence against them. They were terrified. They won a lawsuit against uh, Rudy Giuliani. And don't be surprised if they go after him after the election, too, for a lawsuit. Um, he did it with the judges. He did it with witnesses. He did it with uh, uh, jury members. He did it with January 6th. And now he's doing it in Ohio. This is also a pattern, a habitual behavior mm -hmm. for Donald Trump. And all this will work against him when he finally stands trial for January 6th. Oh, yeah. And Jack Smith is smart enough to know what to do and when. Um now, I know a lot of people are saying that when Kamala Harris takes over, she should make Jack Smith attorney general. And I disagree with that idea. Yeah, not I don't that know he, if he's the best choice. Not that he wouldn't be a great choice. I think he'd be great. I think leave him alone, let him do what he's doing. He's got this thing wrapped up. He's got enough on his plate just dealing with Donald Trump. And then if he becomes attorney general, he'd have to bring in somebody new, get them up to speed to take over running the case. Just let him hammer Donald Trump to the wall and be done with it and bring in anybody else. But it's but Merrick Garland's got to go. Well, and they look at Jack Smith as being extraordinarily tough and serious and tough on crime. And that's great. But it is a political position. Um, and, and Merrick Garland's taken it too political. He's just weak because it's all political with him. And when he makes it political, he does things to not appear political, but what he's doing and the way he's doing it makes it political. It's just fucking ridiculous. They need to get somebody in there that's tough, but understands the process of politics, like a Amy Klobuchar, like a, a Jamie Raskin, somebody who knows and is looking to make people accountable, but knows how to play the game. That's one of the big problems Donald Trump had over and above being a fucking idiot. He didn't know how to play the game. He thought he could control the game and he found otherwise. Joe Biden, right. on the other hand, can play the game and be tough. You're right. Politics is, a, is its own entire entity and it doesn't work really like almost anything else. Right. And you need somebody who not only understands the law, which is why, like Amy Klobuchar, Jamie Raskin, you know, all those people, be good choices. Yeah. But you also need somebody who knows politics yeah. and how to how to do the political stuff, but isn't afraid to do the political thing, especially when it could come back and uh, you know hurt the the, can't, the administration or whatever. 
Merrick Garland should have been investigating Donald Trump from the get go of yeah. the new administration. From the day he became attorney general, there should have been a special counsel put in place to look at all of Donald Trump's actions surrounding the 2020 election, surrounding January 6th, surrounding his taking of the documents, all of it. That should have been the ball should have been going almost immediately because it was obvious it was in the media. This wasn't something that they had a couple of tip sheets buried in the back of the DOJ that they stumbled across two years later. And no. oh, hey, maybe there's something here. Let's look into it. No, this was stuff that was out there obvious and we knew about it. And they just were purposely waiting and we were all waiting for them to do something. Right. And and the thing about it is, is, is that Merrick Garland spent the first two years um, trying to find ways to avoid it try to just let it go because it was too much of a, a a red herring for him. He was worried about it, making it look political. And, you know, that's the one thing that's going to be a relief after the election on November 5th. Everything that's being done by the judicial system is hanging by a thread waiting for that election. Well, we can't because he's running for the presidency. They've been pussyfooting around everywhere they, they go. Jack Smith is doing everything he can, but he's got to do it through Merrick Garland. So he's got to pussyfoot around and not be aggressive. When this is finally done, Donald Trump has gotten what he wanted. He got the delay because of this election, but we're less than two months away from the election. And then there's nothing to protect him. He's, he's hoping against hope he's going to win. But you and I, as we've said, you got to have a fucking prayer. So after that election, life is going to become a living hell for Donald Trump. Yeah, you're right. And Donald Trump will, without a doubt, he's going to launch a bunch of lawsuits. He's going to try to overturn the election again. It's not going to go anywhere. He's going to fight for probably the rest of November if he has the money to do so. And it's going to be a headache for a little bit. And then when when he realizes that's not going to work, I guarantee you the next thing he's going to say is I'm running in 2032. Everyone's going to laugh at him. Republicans are going to say, yeah, good luck with that. And they're going to say, we don't endorse you as our candidate or even as a potential candidate yet. This is way too early. And any protection he thinks he's going to get from that won't happen. But it's just ridiculous. He's delayed himself to the point of inevitability where if he would have, you know, let this stuff happen, there is a chance that, yes, he might not have had a political future and he might not have been running right now for president. But if he would have taken his lumps after right after he was out of office and if they would have come for him immediately and he would have said, OK, put me on trial, whatever, even if he got convicted in all of them and if he would have shown some contrition, et cetera, and acceptance and all of that. He might have gotten out of it without any jail time, and he might he, have gotten nothing but probation, fines, etc., just because nobody wanted to put him in jail. But it, he would have been over and done with it. It wouldn't have been a thing. But now that he's delayed it and he's pissed everybody off, they're all going to push for jail time. Absolutely. Absolutely. You think Elvin Bragg and, and Fonnie Willis and all these people are going to ask for jail time. But Donald Trump has done pretty much what narcissists do because of their ego. They keep pushing it off and pushing it off because they think magically somehow it will go away or they'll be able to pull something out of the hat and they'll be able to make it go away. But it always is the same with narcissists. They put it off, they put it off, they delay, they delay. But inevitably, the, the chickens come home to roost and they have to pay the price. And that is part and parcel why all narcissists crash. They can't put it off forever. And Donald Trump has done a decent job delaying things, but it's over in less than two months. And he's got nothing. He's fucking done. Yeah. And we're watching him fail in real time. Yeah. You know, we're watching him grasp at straws, throw anything against the wall. And that's why he's so desperate with the, with the Springfield, Ohio, and they're eating the pets. You know, the Donald Trump of 2016 never would have said anything like that because he wasn't desperate. Or he would have backed away from it real quickly. But now right. he's desperate. He, he would, he, he's, he's so desperate that he doubles down because it's to him it's got to be true because he needs something to be true. He can't get anything to stick on Tim Walls and Kamala Harris 
<laughs> at all. Not like he did with Joe Biden. Not like he did with uh, Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, you always had something to go back on. You could always go back to Benghazi. Even if you needed nothing else, you had Benghazi and what about her emails? You had two things he could always bring up that were always scandals that people would remember and get irritated by. He doesn't have that with these two. And this is why I say Donald Trump of 2016 is not even close to Donald Trump of 2024. He was younger. He was a little more cognitive. Uh, plus, we didn't know enough about him. In the ensuing eight to 10 years, we found out a lot about Donald Trump. And he's not a likable motherfucker. Even Republicans are going, yeah, I can't stomach that. I can't, I can't get on board with that. I, I hate it when people say, well, in 2016, he won. Well, in 2020, he got his ass kicked. And it's just gotten worse for him every year after 2016. I don't know how people can try to pull that out and say, well, he's got a chance. No, he's a horrible candidate. He's probably the worst presidential candidate in history. He's got so much fucking baggage. There's no other no other explanation other than he's going to get his ass kicked. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, he's going to get beat. It's going to it's not even going to be close. It's going to affect the down ballot. And then when it does, the Republicans are going to have to start backing away from him. But it's too little too late, as we've talked about before. They're going to have to do something drastic to, to reform their party and salvage it out of this. In the meantime, you're going to have as long as Democrats do what they need to do and they get to work and they fix the Supreme Court. They fix the economy issues that, you know, we have right now, the the price gouging, the livable wage, health care. And we do some of this in housing, the things that Kamala Harris says she wants to get done. If they get a bunch of that done, uh, you know, it's going to be great. And the Republicans are going to be struggling to get anything done for a while. And they're going to have to use that time to retool and reconfigure what their their even their message is. Because they're going to need something new to run on. Well, that's what I've said about the Democrats. Uh, assuming they win this the way I think they'll win it, and they get control in the House and the Senate, this is a very big opportunity for them to put their nose to the grindstone and get all the things they say they want to get done, get them done. Because no Republican, if they get all the things done, they can get done. There is no Republican Party in any any form formation that can beat the Democrats. They took over and uh, they did everything they said they can do. People are happier and better off because of it. The Republicans don't have a chance. We could be looking at 10 years before the Republican Party is even a factor, which isn't a great thing because we need two parties, but they fucking did it to themselves. Yeah, you're right. We do need two parties. We need a, we need a countering voice a little bit, but they need to be they need to come up and be more moderate in their countering voice like the option right now in some cases like they were dig they were digging back all the way to pre-civil war to find some reason why kamala harris couldn't be president <laughs> i mean when you're digging back over 150 years of history to look at anything and say oh we need to go back to that people are like oh jesus that's that's a bridge too far but if they're looking back and saying you know if they go back to being like fiscally conservative and oh, we need to watch our spending and find ways of balancing the budget and watch, you know, oh, we're just spending too much money. We need to find a way to make this more affordable because our debt's out of hand or whatever. That might have a chance of getting people on board, depending on where they want to make the cuts. Right. But they're not going to be able to say, well, we need to cut what they call, like to call entitlement, Social Security, Medicaid, no. food stamp. People aren't buying that anymore. They're not buying the idea that a few people getting food stamp money is affecting the national budget on any grand scheme of things. Well, and the thing about it is, is the idea that cutting Medicare and Social Security is a good talking point. Do they realize how many boomers there are out there that are still alive? There's probably 50, 60 million of them. The idea of taking their, in, in many cases, the only income they have away Nobody's going to buy into that. And I think people are realizing because they've said it flat out. Yeah, we got to cut back on Social Security. No, we don't. The Social Security has nothing to do with the fucking budget. Yeah, you're right. And I talked about it. I think it was the last time or the time before that I was on the podcast. 
talking to my parents yeah. who are who have been pretty much conservative lifelong. And like they could not mom could not bring herself to vote for Hillary because of the abortion issue. And Hillary right. was pro-abortion. She can't vote for Donald Trump in part because of Social Security. They're both retired at this point. They're on Social Security. The talks of them cutting that kind of a benefit scare the hell out of them enough that this may be one of the first few times in their life they have voted for a Democrat. Well, and that's the thing about the Republicans. They just keep cutting out prospective voters. Um, The whole idea of cutting out Social Security, that pretty much affects all the old people, my age and older, uh, from, from voting for Donald Trump. That is terrifying to them. Then you talk about Roe v. Wade, that pretty much gets rid of all the young people because that's what that affects. People aren't affected or worried about elections until it bites them in the ass. Now he's bit the seniors in the ass. He's bit the young people in the ass. He's bitten people of color in the ass. He's beaten, uh, uh, he's bitten uh, people of Muslim uh, countries uh, or Muslim religion in the ass. He seems to have alienated everybody except dumb fuck white guys. Pretty much. Uh, and did you see, speaking of old people, did you see the uh, rally they just had over the weekend? Uh, oh, yeah. In the villages. In the villages, I, yeah. I, I only saw a couple clips of it, but it looked like even a bigger turnout than the golf cart rally they had right after Kamala Harris announced. It was it so looked huge. It was so big they had to take it to another venue. That sounds okay. crazy to me because we've got the, the 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 idea of cutting Social Security must have hit home there because this was a very Republican, very red, very Donald Trump area era. And uh, even if there was a, 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 an uprising of some Democrats coming in, in in the villages, they'd probably still be quiet because of all the rabid fucking Republicans. But apparently a whole different case is taking over in, in, in the villages. Uh, you know, hopefully they've been able to shore up the STDs. And then, <laughs> you know, the idea of 80 year old people <laughs> getting STDs. I'm 64 and that makes me a little queasy. What the <laughs> fuck? Really? Oh yeah. Oh, there's but, a hottie. She's only 78. I'm going to talk to her. Yeah. And, and I'm not shaming old people cuz I'm old people, but you know, fuck. This exactly. stuff you're worried about when you were hanging out in bars for God's sake. Uh yeah, and but the idea that the villages might go. That was an area that Donald Trump by won by like 20 or 25 points yeah. in, in 2020 against Joe Biden, another old white guy. Right. And now you have the old white, white people crowd going for the younger Indian African-American woman. What? You never would have thought that. No, you would have never thought that. And a lot of people chasing Oz on TikTok and a bunch of other people are really looking at the prospect of Florida flipping blue. And I'll be honest with you, I'm 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 just throwing this out there. If Florida flips blue, Donald Trump loses without question, regardless of what happens everywhere. It's it's a big state. It's a lot of electoral votes. It's something Donald Trump counted on to get to 270. If they actually flip Florida, that's serious trouble. If Florida and Pennsylvania go blue, it's going to be a blowout. I, I could be wrong on the electoral map, uh, you know, as far as what they're still considering swing states. But I think it's like out of the seven they consider swing states, I think they only need like one and Florida to flip. And she's got the presidency. It's something yeah. like that. It's not very many. Well, don't don't you agree, though, that over and above the win? It really needs to be decisive to get some closure with this country to finally be done with the bullshit we've we've dealt with. Oh, I agree, but I think it's I think beyond that, not just closure. <laughs> I think it needs to be um, a decisive win, both in not just the presidency but down ballot. But then just to send that message to the Democrats: Hey, we got your back this time. Now get some shit done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I mean, Florida has 29 electoral votes. Georgia has 16. Um, it doesn't take much to change the entire complexion of what's going on. I mean, Biden didn't win Florida, and he still won the Electoral College. Um, so as much as people want to predict what's going to happen based on history, I keep saying this. You can't base things on past history because we're in a historical time we've never seen before. It's, it's comparing apples and oranges. You can't tell me what's going to happen in Florida and Texas based on the last election because we're in a different world. Oh, I firmly agree. I think Texas might be in play. And even if Texas doesn't flip blue on the presidential level, I think there's a good chance that, you know, Colin Allred beats Ted Cruz just because no one likes Ted Cruz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's distinctly possible. And in Florida, we've got Rick Scott. You can't tell me if they go blue um, and vote against Donald Trump in Florida that they're going to elect Rick Scott. Rick Scott is in the epitome of a Trump humper. He's being investigated by the FBI. They have his fucking phone. There's no way Rick Scott wins. And they, if you talk to people about history, they're expecting him to win. And I'm not so sure he will. He's a bad candidate too. Yeah, I agree. The only reason he's a decent candidate, and this is the only thing I'm giving him, is he's the incumbent. Well, yeah, that's the one positive he has. That's but he's the a only fucking... positive he has, and that does give him usually an amount of insulation. How much, if that's going to be enough to save him, I don't know. But he's also but the one talking about cutting Social Security and Medicare in a state that fucking thrives on it. Exactly. Now, how amazing would it be? There are 33 senators up for grabs this, you know, this election cycle. Only nine are Republican seats. Right. And we, we've got at least one, maybe two Democrats that are guaranteed to lose. So out of those remaining nine that are Republican seats, if we flip two or three, if we flip three or and we maybe or two and we save one of the ones like uh, Tester in Montana. And we actually gain a seat for the Democrats in the Senate in a year they should have lost the Senate. How amazing would that be? That would be truly amazing. And 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 they will say, well, then the Democrats have to win all 33 Senate seats. That's what makes it tougher for the Democrats. What would make us think they're going to lose? They got elected the first time. They are incumbents, as you said. Um, what makes it so certain that, that any of them are going to lose? I mean, it would be a clean sweep. Maybe that's a surprise to a lot of folks. But again, these fucking times, the abortion uh, issue... I wouldn't be surprised if the Democrats win every one of their 33 seats, except, except Manchin. Manchin yeah. will probably get stuck with a Republican. There's a couple more, but I know like uh, Holly in Missouri, He he's not very well liked in Missouri. Right. And, and there's going to be an abortion issue on the ballot in Missouri. There's a good chance he goes out. Right. Uh, you got Marsha Blackburn in Tennessee. She could get beat. Yeah. And I don't remember who the other five uh, seats are that they have up for grabs. Well, Rick I don't Scott. know how. Well, I was, yeah, I was counting him and Ted Cruz. There's five more Republicans who I can't think of that are up for grabs. They may be in roughly safe states. I'm not sure. But still, if we pick up one or two and we keep Tester, we've gained a seat in the in the Senate. And that's amazing. Yeah. You know, we don't necessarily need to get to 60 to be able to do anything. But if if she even goes into the Senate with a 52 margin and we've gained, you know, a couple that are actually going to do something. So we don't have mansion. We don't have cinema. who are going to actually vote and not hold things up with the Democrats. She's going to be able to get things done. And that's the big thing. Right. Well, if if Kamala wins. We know the House is probably going to win maybe 30 seats, maybe, which puts them in good stead. Uh, and if the Senate, they keep the majority in the Senate. To me, that's a mandate against the Republicans. Like, we don't fucking like you like that anymore. You better make some fucking changes or you're never going to be here. Yeah, you're right. Well, and the thing, though, about the Democrats, I will give them this. Uh, you have... Hakeem Jeffries, who is probably going to be speaker. Yeah. He learned from one of the best yeah. in Nancy Pelosi, who 
has her own issues for some of the things that she said and done, especially involving Joe Biden. But the biggest thing that he learned from her is he won't bring anything to the floor until he has the votes to pass it, no matter the margin. Right. If they, you could give the Democrats the House with one vote and they would get everything they need passed through to help Kamala Harris. Right. Right. Absolutely. They, they they would he they would be able to get it done, get all the votes they need, and it would pass. And they could do it with one vote. They don't need a 30 seat margin, but they're probably going to have it. Whereas Republicans have a five seat margin and can't pass a damn thing. Right. Exactly. Well, we're going to wind things down here, but I just want to ask one thing. The one thing that's on everybody's mind and that is this this budget issue that they've got to come together with on, uh, at the end of the month. Uh, and everybody's talking about a shutdown and such. And like I've said, the last three times they've done this, I don't believe they're going to shut it down. You have a different uh, perspective on that? No, I agree with you. I've been saying the same thing. They're going to come to a, a deal on the last day. I said what they were going to do, and they may still do it this week, is they're going to try to bring this SAVE Act up with uh, the the uh, ID thing and the citizenship proof to to have to vote or whatever um, as a, a vote. Now, it'll probably, even if it passes the House, they only want to get it out there so they can try to have a talking point against the Democrats. Um, and then when it comes down to brass tacks, they're going to pass what they have to pass, kick the can down the road. Yeah. yeah but no. this whole save thing, like I've been, I've been saying in my TikToks, it affects not only uh immigrants and people who weren't citizens who already aren't voting um but it affects everyday people like you know if they pass this at the end of the month we'd have a month to get all of our information together and go down and make sure we can register to vote and make sure you know you have your birth certificate and you have the names lining up and you have the updated records and you have like if you're married and you've changed your name you would need the the birth certificate, you would need the marriage license, the name name change form, all of it. Like you would need everything. Like they would make it so hard on even citizens and everyday people who have voted for years to be able to vote. Yeah. That there's no need for it. No. And it would just complicate things. But all they have is cheating. So that's all the only reason they want to do things. Absolutely. Well, we're going to wrap things up for the Rational Boomer podcast. Eric, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it immensely. Um, I always look forward to having guests on the show. Yesterday, I did a, a live on YouTube, which was kind of a interesting experiment. It's a big difference from TikTok. Um, and I did it because I just didn't want to sit here by myself and 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 do what I normally do. I wanted a little more excitement. I wanted some input. And so I thought I'd try YouTube. It's it's a much slower pace than TikTok, but I still got some interesting input. And then when I have somebody actually live sitting here with me, it makes it so much easier. And I think it 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 it's a better, better show for for the people listening to. It gives some different perspectives. And uh so I appreciate you coming in today. Well, thanks for having me. I always love being on the show. Um I didn't get a chance to catch your live while it was going on, but I did enjoy watching it after the fact. Well, yeah, that's that's the thing uh, for those folks, uh, because I'm a lazy bastard. I did the live. I recorded the live and that became the Rational Boomer podcast. So I killed two birds with one stone because I'm lazy, but I think it worked out all right. And and I think it's worth listening to if you haven't already. Um, well, We'll, we'll we'll be keeping in touch. You'll be back at some point in the not too distant future, I'm sure. Uh, I think Jace is going to be on tomorrow, so we'll get a Texas perspective from that. Uh, and old soul, and hopefully Ed will get back and stuff. So we got a lot of stuff planned, and it's going to be busy up through November 5th. So just try to hold it together in Iowa, and let's try to cut that spread from four percent for Kamala to uh, a four percent lead. Oh, I would love to see that. I have been, you know, saying it in a lot of videos whenever I have content that talks about it, like about Iowa or about states I think could flip. I leave comments in videos where I think it's appropriate. Like, hey, Iowa's in play. Let's make it happen. And I think we can flip Iowa blue. If not, maybe at the presidential level, maybe we can flip some of our state reps. Maybe we can flip some state seats or maybe our yeah. U.S. House of Representative seats, something. Um, 
But I think if we flip Iowa blue top of the ticket, we're flipping it, you know, seats down ballot too. And that is going to be amazing to see. We haven't been blue since Obama. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that wasn't that far long ago, and uh, maybe we can do it again. Let's hope. Uh, for those of you listening, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, to listen. I hope you have a great day, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow.